Good afternoon. March the 21st, 2014. This is CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Today is day number 11 in week number 6. Welcome back. I'm so glad to tell you that at least finally I got 8 students out of 16 students in this class. That means 50% of the students in this class are willing to complete the questionnaire for us. Well, next time I might have to ensure that I have pieces arrive in order to convince all of you to do the questionnaire. So I'm thinking of installing a piece of prize for those of you who finish the questionnaire in the second degree contract. Okay, as a teacher, it's very important for me to share with you the discovery in the first learning contract, although um, half the class did not um, finish it. But anyway, let's just do it. Now let's take a look at the questionnaire result. Uh, I got, uh, as you can, the number of eight students completing this. So let's take a look at the response to the question, one after the other. Now the first questions invite you to take a good look at the GE program intended learning outcome, which are seven, okay, in the GE handbook in our syllabus, and ask for your feedback to take a look at your learning experience in the first learning contract. Do you agree that your learning experience in the first learning contract has been decided and rendered consistently according to the GE over intended learning outcome? Let's take a look at the result. Of the eight students, one student say no, okay. Four say slightly agree, two said agree, and one said strongly agree. So, um, if I count the number of votes, I have to say that with all the respect to the one student who say disagree, let me do a better job in the second learning contract to make sure you understand the PIL role. And I'm going to set a very, very simple exercise for you to experience that, okay? The second one, take a look at that. The question itself is very similar, but it asks for not just the GE program intended learning outcome, but the course learning objective. How many course learning objectives are there? Three. Three in the this course syllabus. And let's take a look at your feedback on the learning experience. Do you agree that your learning experience in the first learning contract has been decided and rendered consistently according to the CMO, course learning objective? I got one slightly disagree, I got four slightly agree, I got two agree, and I got one strongly agree. When we look at the result, okay, basically it's the same, but when we look at this person, instead of disagree, he says slightly disagree. That means it's one step further for me. He, he, he is it just steps away from that, okay? So I think I need to do a little bit more to make sure I win fans from this class, all right? It's very important for me to know how, in what way I need to do something. And then, when we look at question number three, now, this question is almost the same as the first two questions, except that we would like you to pay attention with the course intended learning outcomes in the service. Now, if you have already studied our syllabus, you know that only one section in the syllabus has this information. That is the very last section called OPTL details. Okay? And thank you very much. If you look at the result, okay, although I have two students who disagree because we have actually not touched that course in another learning outcome so far. That is the context of the third learning contract. But out of the eight students, I have six supporters at least, okay? And you are jumping ahead of my schedule indeed. I did not tell you anything specific on that except in one teacher's message, okay? But I have two slightly agree, three agree, one strong agree, and two disagree. So basically, it's a very interesting, very positive result. Now let's take a look at question number four. Do you agree that this general education course has been delivered so far according to the course schedule? Now, 
this is a tricky question in a sense. When I say course schedule, if you look at the paper copy syllabus, the course schedule is just an outline of the number of weeks with a very simple topics. But if you look at the course schedule in the UN Moodle side, it is very detailed. It's detailed in the sense you are fully informed of what you're supposed to study each week. And in that case, I have given you a more than enough picture for that. Now let's take a look at the results. Assuming all of you have read both the course schedule in the paper copy and the online schedule with all the 15 weeks materials there, look at the result. I have seven supporters which said yes according to this course schedule. I got one strongly agree, one agree, three slightly agree, oh no, I got five, and I got two slightly disagree, one disagree. This is something very interesting. Let's take a look at it. I do not know it, but you can ask yourself, this is very interesting. When this person disagree, oh sorry, when this person disagree, has he or she actually studied both? Both, okay, both the paper copy and the UN Moodle side, okay? If he or she has studied both and come up with this disagree, I think this is a very interesting student who does a lot of practical thinking, okay? Because he is going to compare what we are doing so far and check it very carefully with the schedule, both the hard copy and the UN Moodle side. And I have two more students who seem to express some kind of inconsistency here, although he did, we, we did not follow up with further questions. So what this three tells me, uh, I have three students out of these eight students who thinks a lot. It does not mean the other student does not think, but he thinks out of the box instead of inside the box. What does it mean by out of the box? He or they are willing to think about the possibility of deliver according to question, paper copy, or you have to sign. So I have three persons I need to win over in this particular question. In this particular question, and how can I do it to win over it? Well, I'm going to uh, discuss with you in this class after introducing this. Now let's take a look at the. Questions number five. Now, when you look at questions number five, this is not the kind of agree or disagree question. But if you look at question number five, I will discover something very basic. First of all, out of the eight persons, I got one student who has never studied the gender education handbook so far. I got six who have studied some, I got one who have studied more than 50. Okay, now let's take a look at question number six. This time, instead of the general education handbook, I mean the syllabus. In this particular sense, I have all the six students who have already studied the syllabus, but only one completely, two more than 50, five less than 50. Now let's take a look at these results. And this two and this two, okay? And then, now let's take a look at number seven. Which part of the course syllabus have you studied as suggested by the instructor? I have six persons who study course outline. That means I have two persons who never study part A. What's going to happen to these two persons? Okay. I have three persons who study B. I have five persons who study C. I have one person who study D. Okay. Now how am I going to link this to the result in the questions above, particularly when we will talk about CILO? Okay? Now keep that in mind. And then we're going to look at questions number eight. Now, take a look at that. Part A 
three or uh, two persons will consider it's the most difficult part. Well, which is consistent with number six. Okay? If I have six persons who study part A, and now out of six, I have two persons believe that the most difficult is reasonable. Okay? Part C, one person believes it's the most difficult. And out of these five persons who study part C, at least one person who believes it's the most difficult, reasonable, one is less than five. Okay? Part D, O, B, T, L, and O, G, cost delivery, I have two persons who believe this is the most difficult. Now, take a look at this. Only one person said they study part D, but I have two persons who said this is the most difficult. Do you see the differences? Okay? In terms of number? And then, no one said in question 7, they have studied OPTL, but all of a sudden, I got two persons who said, this is the most difficult. You see the inconsistency between data collections? Okay? No, no, because even, even they believe that it's the most difficult, if you have already studied that part, if you've named this, that means you've already studied that part here. I should have part E here with two persons, at least. But no one said they studied this part, and all of a sudden, I got two persons, they believe this is the most difficult. That means either these two persons have not actually studied that. They just believe this is the most difficult. So you see that we have missing data in question seven. We have all of a sudden win four data in question number eight. Th this is the logic, okay? This is the logic for me to explore the uh, very interesting thing. And then question number nine, okay? How have you studied the cost model science suggested by your instructor? One set out of eight completely, three set fewer than 10, 4 set fewer than 5. Okay, this is just data. And then do you agree, having studied the general education handbook will help you understand better the course learning design according to the public syllabus? This is very interesting. Now, in the questions previously, I invite you to name, have you ever studied the general education handbook? And there are a few possibilities, okay? More than 50%, less than 50%, not all completely. And let's take a look at these. Here I have two okay, disagree, one strong disagree, one slightly disagree, because the link is not there. And actually this question is to look for the disagreement, because uh, this handbook, and the cost syllabus does not seem to be hooked up very consistently. But the general education handbook gives the philosophy of the general characteristic of GE course. And in this course syllabus, I have not actually given any specific characteristic of the GE course except in one part which is very much close, that is design learning experience. So principally speaking, I expect more people who will give me strongly disagree or slightly disagree, okay? Because they are actually not strongly linked in the context of the two. But thank you so much in this class. I got support. I got three who say it's not degree, even though he may not. Finally, for the sake of learning experience, I got three support here, two support here, and one strongly support here. Now, I have not given a follow-up question yet. Normally, if you want to trace how you position the answer, we will say, if you say agree or disagree in question 10, please tell us the connection. Now, in the second learning contract, you will have some questions like this, because that is the traces of students' work. So, do you see that I'm grateful for this class, at least eight of you, and out of the eight of you, we have um, six of you who's very kind of me. Okay? This is how I detect the kindness of the students. Okay? 
teachers will use some of this kind of question to look for the general impressions of reactions. Very interesting, that's the way we do research, we discover from reaction. We do not need to express it now, we look at it in general, okay? And then, let's take a look at 11, question 11. Do you agree that having studied the proper syllabus, uh, you will understand, including the course design philosophy, which we read it out last time, would help you understand better the day-by-day -day classroom online activity I got all of you who support it. Now, when you compare the response to this question to the previous one, you understand basically my students have difficulty linking the two together. They do not have any specific against of the service. They could have difficulty linking what is meant by GE and this course together. So the direction is we need to do a little bit more to help you understand the nature of GE. And then question number 12. Do you agree that the published course syllabus including the first time, namely, I point to where you can find the OBTL detail has been well organized to help you understand better the day-by-day -day classroom and online activities. And you see I got all the support which is consistent with question 11. When I do not link up the GE handbook with the syllabus, long away I got support, which is indicated by all the number of degrees. But the interesting thing here is, I have eight students, right? But I just got seven responses here. Why? What happened to this student? Maybe he or she gives up this question. Or he just say, oh, it's too long, let me just stop right here. You, that is very interesting. It's a very interesting phenomenon uh, here. Yeah. Questions number 13 again, I can seven. I don't have eight. Do you agree that the blended learning format uh, of this course has been helpful to you? I got all the support here, and I'm grateful. Okay? Although I have one this. What is it? And question 14, the weekly electronic resources, they use for all the three, okay? So I got great for an example one, yeah. And questions number 15, 16, the dual call, the weekly dual formats of interactive lecture and student sharing very well received by the students here, except for one student, so they didn't throw up the answer. And 16, how many weeks electronic resources have you actually discovered useful or examined? Only the second week, I have one person. The first and second week, one person. The first and the fourth week, one person. Only three out of the four weeks, two persons, and all the four weeks, two persons. Now, this is data, okay? And then, let's take a look at 17. Do you agree that this GE course helped you participate actively in class? Well, you see that um, this is a signal for me, and it's one person of the A who discovered that. No, it's not active participation enough. So I need to think of more possibility for you to join the participation. Currently, I send a call for participation each week. Currently, I use the video to show you and then invite each one of you to do um, expressions of your idea. But maybe there is something more I can do. Maybe a table activities or maybe soft exercise. But I cannot do something other than what is required of you in the learning contract. So I must design activity within the, the, the range of the learning contract. Okay? So I'm putting some thought in this question. And what about this one? Do you believe this GE course can help you develop your independent learning in a subject area of your choice? I got one student who say this slightly disagree. But I have six students who say yes. And with that disagree, I need to ask myself this question, teacher. 
Um, do we have common language of what is meant by independent learning? Does it mean that my student do not believe that um, what we are doing can help him or her do a better job in learning something? So that is a question. It's very important. So you can help me answer it when you ask me questions. And then question number 19, do you agree that this GE course could help you understand the related knowledge applications in everyday life situation? Oh, that is very good. I got all the support that you believe what you learn here, example, video, or discussions, could really help you do that, in particular the OIA process. But do you uh, agree that this GE course can help you think critically about the course topic? I got six supporters and one who disagreed. So maybe I need to show you more about what we can do in terms of understanding critical thinking. Okay? So, and then questions number 21. Do you agree this course can help you develop your communication ability in terms of reading, writing, and speaking? And I got the supporters of all the seven except one, which is A. And then, do you agree that the instructor of this course can help you learn to learn? I got one who has doubt, and I got six who believe it's the case. So that is something that tells me I need to work out more uh, about the definitions of learn to learn and the process. And then, question number 23. It's very interesting. Now, which item below have you completed and submitted for learning contract 001? I have seven who finished online learning journal, seven who finished peer discussion forum, five who finished the, the report, three who finished the blog, four who finished proposal, and four who finished 15 minutes. But look at that when I check the view submission is more than this. But this is done after the uh, submission names are closed. So I'm a little bit interested in understanding how, but definitely I can come back only half of you have done this. And let's take a look at the, this question 24. This is very interesting. Only one out of the eight students who said he did or she did Masters of amount of time used in the first learning contract, six did not do so. But, but, take a look at this. And then the next question tells me, well, actually, more than one of you did master your time, otherwise, you cannot give me the answer to question number 25. One set less than two hours, four set two to four hours. One set for six hours, and one set more than six hours. Let's take a look at that. This is per week. Based on this indication, I have six students who is very sensitive about the time used per week. And how can these six persons say they never measure the time? If you never measure the time, how do you know the number of hours spent per week? So, do you see the contradictions? That's the reasons why you need to be uh, um, trained in a second learning contract on self-regulated learning. One of the important areas in self-regulated learning is you need to know the timeline of your work. When you need to know the timeline of your work, you need to know how much time you need to put into to get it done. And based on that, you are already answering the time spent. Simple, right? Okay, questions number 26. Ah, very interesting, right? If I have six students of the age say, never been to the time, how can you give me the number of hours you actually spend in the first learning contract? All right? So, by doing that, as a research person, when you look at the number like this, I would say there is still something I need to do to help my student understand what is meant by work to do and time to do the work. When you do the work to get something done, you're actually spending time to do it. But if you do not pay attention to the amount of time you spend, 
that is the trigger of project information literacy point number four frustrations. We never know what is meant by getting something done. So this tells me some very interesting data. I have students who recall the amount of time they spend after declaring that they did not measure the time. Do you understand the meaning of that? When I have students who recall the amount of time they spent after the care they did not measure the time, that means they are yet to know time management. And that is the purpose of the secondary contract. Okay. So questions number 27. I have three students choosing uh, working uh, finishing week one's journal, three finishing week two's journal, um, two finishing week three's journal, and three finishing week four's journal. Now we don't add this up because it's the classifications. And how many of you uh, choose a topic from which week's journal? Three from week one, two from week three, two from week four. When I expect that maybe you would not choose week three. The reasons? This is the win three questions, okay? And still we have two students of the eight who choose to do this particular week's journal. That means you are not lazy at all. You are really doing something good. And this is the result. And let's take a look at the IBL. Now, what concerns me when I look at questions number 30, it's I have two students who said no comments on this day. Why? Because if you have actually done learning contract 001 and gone through the OIA process, I should expect at least something like this. Okay? But if you say no comment, I'm a little bit taken back because it does not seem to me that this two student learning contract number one has any impact on you. Uh, and maybe the school not sure what you're going to get out of it. What does it mean? Because any assignment, uh, when it is being done by a student through a period of time, has a purpose. And the purpose is to give you a chance to experience learning through down-to-earth activity. But I've got two students that tell me, no comment. That means you're not, uh, you're not touched by the the learning activities yet. So this is a little bit concerned for me. And then when I say, what do you like most about this course? I got all the feedback. But let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Only seven. That means one did not do it. Group discussion to share opinion may be very positive. Videos so during class of discussion, very positive. Help with your critical thinking, sharing organizations and skills. The information security really benefits us as we know more about how to protect our information security needs, which makes a great difference. This student is very, very conscious of what we are doing in the first learning contract. The topic is very close to our daily life, okay, very positive. Develop student responsibility and active learning. Wow. Look at this student, it's a very serious student, okay? Uh, learn something new. I like all of them, they are perfectly designed. I want to congratulate the designer of this course, that means you're telling me. Uh, it really helped us to improve our ability and increase our skill knowledge. Wow, I never read something so good as this, okay? Chemistry, well, I'm not teaching chemistry in this course. And I figure out what the molecules are. But anyway, I mean, the, I think the student means the atmosphere that is very important. Okay? And then what about what they believe has to be changed? Well, the first one is using Chinese. I try to use Chinese after class, okay? But in the class, since the official language in this course is English, I cannot use Chinese in class. Okay, that is the rule of the university. 
okay? But we can help you to understand better when you ask me during the break or after class in Chinese. I think as far as good, maybe we can discuss more, okay? And have more discussions in class, which can develop a critical thinking. And this student said, I have no idea, okay? So I have to give you more ideas, okay? There's too much information for students to absorb. I think that it's the questions, okay? You need to decide what to absorb, not me to tell you. Uh, but you need to go through a process that is called information literacy skill. At the beginning, students may have no way to do anything if you do not choose a topic. I think they should have some instructions about this course of student. I think I've given a lot of instructions in my websites already. But it's just not so much that I try to make it much more explicit. Okay, I'm going to show you one more time. More slack, okay, I promise. More slack will come, all right? So, I think the assessment process must be changed. Okay, assessment process. I, I have not done a lot, but the, the assignment, that means the learning process, a little bit, especially assignment too much, okay. This is something that has to be seasoned, okay. Um, the reasons why we have six items in the first learning contract and seven items in the second learning contract is this is an opportunity for you to manage your time to achieve some goals. And we start with a topic. The topic must be managed to produce a journal. Without a journal, you cannot do discussion. Without a discussion, you cannot do a report. Without a report, you cannot write a blog. And in order to do all of this, you need to meet with your friends and have some meetings with it. So all of these are one connected to the other. And it's a process, okay? And yes, in a sense, it's an assessment design because I want to see which part you're doing weekly so as to produce the second one. Do you know that there's something called G-I-G-O? G-I-G-O? Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage, the rubbish in the rubber's power. Do you understand what it means? If you do not select a topic and you do not produce a good journal, which is garbage journal, no matter how much you're going to discuss it, it will be garbage discussion. And garbage discussion produces garbage report. And garbage will not produce garbage blog. And so you must start with something that is good enough and when you see the chain effect, uh, assignment requires some items. And for that, it's a formative process. And that is the essence of GE course. And not only in the major course, they look at the final product. And so in some of those major courses, maybe you don't have a lot of homework. You just need to finish the exam 100% or 80%. But um, that is a little different from here. Outdoor mall, maybe we'll go to the new campus sometime, okay? we go to walk through the new campus, and, uh, all right? So that is something very interesting. So thank you very much for giving this data for me to take a look at. As a teacher, I need your input in order to get something out. All right, let me take attendance first, and then I'll show you, uh, today we have at least one student who would like to share. Uh, Christy, are you here? Christine, thank you. Shema, thank you. Amelia, yes. And then Michael, Michael, thank you. Jacqueline, thank you. Antonio, thank you. Uh, Stopsy, thank you. Ivy, thank you. Maggie, thank you. Thomas is not here today. And then Angie is not here. Lampard, thank you. Zihin, uh, thank you. Julia, yes. And then Lauren, thank you, Lauren. And then Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, let's get back to our business of this week. This is week number six, okay? And we cover a little bit on web attack and internet vulnerability last time. And today is day 11. We need to cover the ethical issues of hacking and cracking. So I'm going to introduce to you some famous hackers today. Uh, I'll give you two hackers, hopefully. And get ready and listen to this hacker. Give you 15 minutes of interactions with him. Okay? So, 
Yes. What happened? I didn't have the sound. So it's definitely, if the computer has sound, it's just the lights here do not have the sound. Okay, give me a little bit more light. Yes. Proxy. If 
If anyone tries to track me later, they'll just see China in there and blame them. China bashing is totally in vogue right now. Uh, the next thing I did was set up an email address. The American NSA permanently record and monitor all international internet traffic and most domestic stuff too in their total data awareness program. So to keep off their records, I chose web.com.na from Namibia. Now I needed a domain name and I found the company domainsforbitcoins.com. They're in the Netherlands and I registered the domain destroyreputation.com. I avoided a .com because um, the customs and FBI regularly shut those down and .me is kind of cool, plus it's the country code for Montenegro. It's critically important to pick new and different countries for everything because any investigations that might take later will be stalled and usually killed in their tracks at every border. Finally, I needed hosting, so I picked privacy.li. It's another place that takes Bitcoin. They're a Chinese bulletproof web host run from a Liechtenstein website on servers in Malaysia. They don't want to know who you are or what you're doing. You give them bitcoins, they give you server space. It's as simple as that. So I need to get my clicker. Okay, so hackers don't need ethics. So I just ripped off the design of some website I found. They'll probably never know, and even if they did, how could they possibly catch me? So here it is. <laughs> I decided to sell reputation destruction services. Customers pay me, and I click up, uh, kick off a blizzard of negative publicity that utterly impugns the character of whoever they target. Humans love revenge, and they generally believe anything negative without question so I can't fail. Hey, I found it on the internet, so it must be true, right? An even neater aspect of a hacker business is you don't actually have to run the business. Sure, random idiots are giving me $200 worth of Bitcoins this week, but what's the worst they can do? Find some other reputation destruction service to try and destroy my reputation? Well, unless they're terminally stupid, they've just already learned that lesson. Seriously though, this is the number one operating paradigm of fraudulent businesses. They take your money and then do nothing. Ethics are dangerous. If you're foolish enough to actually ship robot bunnies, make sure you don't put your name and address on the shipping label, and cross your fingers those bunnies aren't traceable and hope your supplier won't wrap you out if someone comes hunting for you. Now let's compare this with, with a legitimate business. What if you want to actually get rich at selling robot bunnies? You'll need a proprietary limited trading company, which takes about a week and costs a grand. We need to provide various forms of identification, including all your home, business and postal addresses, nominate shareholders and executives and identify all them too, register with ASIC and commit to their annual reporting and fees. Establishment requires a bank account, so you'll need a spare day, 100 points of identification and a commitment to pay business and bank account fees for the rest of the time. You'll eventually need to register for GST and do VAS reports four times every year. You're on the internet, so you'll be wanting an ACN and a corporate key for ASIC and an OZ key for the ATO. And then another key, OZ key, each time they get hacked again, like happened last month. Anyway, unless you've got Superman capacity to tolerate paperwork, you're going to need to pay an accountant to deal with your annual tax returns and reporting. And don't forget to keep ASIC perpetually updated with your whereabouts or square and giant corporate fine. You might already have assets or hope soon to have some, so you're going to want to protect them in due course, which means you need a discretionary trust as well, which itself needs a trustee, which is going to need to be a different proprietary limited company and run by somebody else. So you need to double everything you just did and add your partner into the mix, double down on the number of tax returns, bank accounts and asset forms you need to complete, and don't forget to pay your capital gains tax. I'm not even halfway. <laughs> Today's internet is all about venture capital, otherwise known as smart money. And that really only comes from one place, Silicon Valley. Sure, maybe you can get investors from elsewhere, but that's dumb money. This is the internet, you need smart. If you want any investment from the valley, you won't get it unless you've got a Delaware C Corp, which is a must-have standard for online business structures. Even if you seek investment from any place else, without a C Corp, you have half your chances. At uh, USA Trip to form one last corporation, another bank account with fees, annual Delaware taxes, USA tax returns, and 30 grand in legal fees to 
just like Apple look for contracts and intercompany worldwide licensing. If you're looking for funding, you need marketing collateral, business plans, and intellectual property protection like patents and trademarks. So you need an attorney. Fundraising is a full-time job, so you'll need an employee. Now you'll also need quarterly superannuation, quarterly PAYG, and annual group certificates. I'm absolutely serious. You really cannot skip any of that stuff. I've, been, I've established a dozen IT businesses over the last 16 years, so I know this. The benefit of all that paperwork means PayPal will let you have an account to accept payments and you can now buy a domain with hosting. GoDaddy does both for peanuts. And at last you can hire designers and programmers to code your site, start trading, shipping and paying tax. Now let's look at some, some things that can go wrong. The hacker business really only has one problem, getting caught. That's never going to happen. There's no such thing as an international police force Domestic police all get stopped at international borders and you've already covered your tracks. The legitimate business is another story. PayPal refused all payments from more than 60 different countries. And if you accidentally log in while you're overseas, they'll cancel your account, which freezes all your money and prevents all your customers from paying you. Credit cards are even worse than PayPal. Online fraud is rampantly out of control. And you, the merchant, bears the full cost of this crime, plus commissions, plus chargebacks, plus penalties, etc. Domains. A while back, my domain got cut off by GoDaddy. Lloyd's Bank is one of my customers, and somebody reported me to GoDaddy for impersonating a bank. GoDaddy gave me two and a half hours to explain, but never answered their phone, never returned my email, never answered my voicemails, and didn't check the evidence in the first place. Patent trolls, the scourge of the internet. The US patent system is way beyond broken. The US PTO is so overloaded they can and do grant patents on anything, like one click payments, rounded corners, or exercising cats with laser pointers. Seriously. There's three million US patents out there, which basically means there's an army of greedy speculators with legal monopolies on practically every aspect of the internet. As soon as they see you've got money, say hello to an Eastern District of Texas courtroom, plus two years of stress, and goodbye to three million in legal fees, plus a grand hundred million in damages. And you'll never get those fees back, not even when the patent gets found invalid, which happens more than half the time. My troll sued Adobe, PayPal, Amazon, half a dozen other big names, my company, me personally, and my ISP. About a week later, my ISP cut me off. In other words, for the $350 it takes to file a lawsuit, you can kick any legitimate site you want off the internet, just to sue their ISP. So there it is, my message for change. Am I asking our governments to look after us better? I'm suggesting you sort that out yourself. You decide. Thanks, Chris. You're listening to this interesting talk, and you do not believe that you understand anything of it. Let me remind you, the topic of this talk is hacking business, offered by Chris Brack. Hacking business. In other words, you're trying to legitimate the business of hacking into someone else's computer, or offering something that's supposed not to be will, you will set up a company just to fool people around, okay? With all these kind of very sophisticated procedures that you set up with a company, with a sign, with a domain, and with the protection of being needle is sure to you. You got everything set up by this guy who can tell you, even though you discover who I am, this, this much you can do. Okay? Now, this is a very interesting talk in the sense that someone who's trying to legitimate a hacking business and so you a blueprint of what you need to do to set it up. Now, questions come. Oftentimes, in the car, we hear the judiciary police say, 
looks like the spheres we have reductions of the traditional crime, but on the aspect of computer-related crime, we have a lot of jumping up. Normally, those crime can hardly be cracked because when they trace on those crime, it's mostly an act of voluntary actions on the victim because they believe those signs. Okay? And the setting of those signs is it. It's just like a business. It's so skillful. Okay, and that's why this guy came up here. Another video we've got that we're not going to show you today, because we want to take a time to do it first. As you can see, the same person is not going to give you the idea of, okay, how it's done to do the hacking with the computers, okay? Just 15 or 16 minutes. And these are very interesting. This guy called Paul Powers Hoffman. Okay? Uh, when he's doing the talk, he's showing to you, he's hacking into a system with a screen there, and you can see what he's doing. It's a lesson learned for a lot of people who is willing to trust some of the science. Okay? So before I continue, let me double check on. I, I, I think I have a student who would like to share today. Yeah, two, right? Mandy and Julia, right? So today, may I just pass the time to Mandy and then Julia? You still have more than enough time for you to share first. You want to do that? Okay. I thought I signed at 17 March. 17 March. Oh, oh, yes, it's okay, because last time I didn't give it to you, so this time I want to make sure you've got a chance to, to earn your score. Yeah, do you want to pass to Julia first? Do it now. Okay, so may I give you the microphone? So um, let me just make sure the camera is for you. This is a very important class participation plan. Before I introduce you to the great uh, the video TED Talk, have you ever watched TED Talk before in your own time? TED Talk. TED Talk is very popular. This is the TED Talk I've just shown you. The different kind of topics. Okay, the different kind of audience. Okay, I, I often look up late videos there. Make sure you, you can expose yourself to this kind of uh, very interesting information. Ready? Of our ship as well as the master of our own fate. 
Nobody will always say that you are so great, but at some silent, quiet moment, we should uh, figure out who we really are. Actually, we can define ourselves rather than others to define uh, who you are. That's all, thank you. I think it's very excellent to help us to understand the process of your personal effort in getting things done. Thank you, Julia. Okay, so uh, Mandy, are you ready? You need to pick up the microphone. <laughs> All right, do you need a computer? Okay, uh, do you have the adapter to hook up to your computer? You, you need help? Thank you. Okay, take your time. You got everything ready there, I see. Wow, look at that. Yes, just take it easy. You can do it. Make sure. Yeah. Julia, just tell us. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> before I prepared this survey before I took a look of the reading this week and web attack. Thank you. Yes, then then I thought what is that attack? Is like body to body. You find me, I find you back that attack. Then I found that is Something, something like disaster from the internet, or uh, in in computer disaster, okay. and we got a wolf firewall. Right. Hmm. It's okay. You can uh, let's see. You copy the link to a new browser tab and you try it again. Yeah, sometimes it works that way. Because you are using the your model to carry things out, if you do it directly, it might be better. Just go again. Yes. Did yeah. you know your plant vessels are as long as the U.S. oil pipeline system? It's okay. This is an app, just a couple of seconds. Then I, I found this, later I found this video, it's talking about the wave, wave of web attack from China. Okay, thank you, very, very good thoughts. Uh, some time back, operational war up has been done. In fact, we 
uh, spoke with Dmitry Alperovich, one of the guys who actually went in and investigated that. We all think about Google having been a part of uh, an important breach, but there were dozens of other companies, Melissa, that also suffered significant losses of data and never came forward. All right, sorry, right. And so, so after watching this or before watching this, I would think if you get attacked, what would you do? Right. When we get defined, but the problem is, can we get defined? Uh, just like I said, I got every every computer has their firewall inside their software. Or maybe we can add more powerful software to protect our computer or internet, something like that. Uh, but I think just depends on this news. I don't know whether it's real or not. If, if really the hacker is so powerful, can we really get protection? I don't really think about this pri privacy things, right? Right. And, and I will, uh, our Asian China will have a center because the Trump is not here, so I don't trust it as this. Right. For the December or more, and December or yao. Okay. I thought I would get translated back from the Hagar. This is my share. Thank you. I think it's very meaningful. And uh, this video itself has given us a lot of awakening. Thank you. Uh, well, we do not know exactly if the reported case of a company whose 10 years research and development result was stolen by a hacker overnight, and the company lost millions of dollars because of that. Well, I would say it looks like it's not a very real story because, yes, it could be stolen. But even though it could be stolen, it's impossible for that company to lose a billions of dollars because of that. Now, this story helped me to remember one real-life case which was reported in Hong Kong about a few weeks ago. This is the story. A small startup company in Hong Kong set up by a couple of graduate students, okay? They're very excellent in doing technology. And then there was uh, delegations of business people from China. This is technology related. And through some departments, government departments in Hong Kong, the delegations was invited to pay a visit to that company. And of course, as a startup, you welcome this opportunity because in the US, when people look at your work and their interest, they will buy your company. Okay? And you've got a lot to pay back because of that. But what happened is after the visit of that company by some people who are believed to be a business owner of certain corporations in China, one month or two months after that, that company released a product which is basically the same product demonstrated by the small company in Hong Kong. And the small staff was surprised why our product, without our rolling up to the market, it was already there. That is one way of espionage. And that espionage was even face to face. Because today, when someone demonstrates a product to you, you can always use your cell phone to videotape the same thing. And you can always capture all wonderful features. And they just took that feature back into their own company. And with that feature, they set our product with exactly the same ideas. And that, your ideas, disappear. That is a new story, I understand. And it's quite famous today because that's the reasons why a lot of the start company they become smarter when they sell something to someone else. Normally, the something they go to demonstrate has already been patented in the United States. And so if something similar to that comes out after that, they go to the court to resolve the case. But in Hong Kong, everything is so immature. It's just like uh, you, you, you work 10 days, you produce the report for the very country one. It's your report. 
and then you have new partner. You serve your report to new partner. And your new partner has a friend, and then they got your work. And then before you submit it, they submit your work and claim it as their work. What are you going to do? You're going to kill him? No, it's not like this. You sow it to him. Right? Something like this would happen. So it's very touchy and very sensitive. And in the following week, we're going to introduce you once again the context of social engineering. And sometimes we often give up a lot of information to people without paying attention to this sensitive area. Okay? So we thank you very much for Maggie's uh, contributions today, giving us ideas on web attack with this very interesting news coverage. And we also thank Julia. She's always that kind of person who gives us a lot of confidence. Give it, do it, give it, do it, I can do it, I can do it, and then she can do it. Um, I thank you so much for today's, and uh, make sure you have one week's left for the learning country fund too. Okay? So, may I just give the rest of the time for you to discuss among yourself to form your strategic partnership. Okay? And of course, if you have a question, you can ask me. I think 10 minutes or we have 15 minutes for is good for you to talk about one another to form a team of two peers to get ready to get things done. Okay? And you must have your meetings done also. Okay, let me just stop talking and give you time at least 10 minutes to talk about yourself to see how you're going to manage your work. So I'm going to stop my class lectures here and I'm going to pass the time to my students to talk about themselves table by table. If you have a question, they can ask me. Okay? Alright? Do you understand what you need to do in the second learning contract? How are you going to do it? Have you had good discussions among the table members? Who is going to do what? Okay? So the due date is March. 29. Today is March the 21st. One week's left, and of course you can have five more days. Okay, so the final due date will be starting from March the 29th to April the 4th. Okay, April the 4th will be the final day for your submission of your secondary contract. So look for strategic partners.
That's it for today's CISG 113 Section 1 Information Security and Privacy. Today is day 11 in week number 6. See you in week number 7.